I'm Jack Osmond, and you're listening. This is Mr. Harry, and you're listening to. I'm Richard C. Hilton, and you're listening to. I'm Art Bell, and you're listening to Dr. J Radio Live. We have an unidentified flying object. Jason Martel. Mr. Martel, welcome to the show. Hey, Dr. J, thank you so much for having me on the air with you. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's a long time coming. Honestly, for the last few years, I've been wanting to reach out to you, and it just worked out perfectly having all your stars. And and I just got to say this about you. Everyone knows you as being a a major star on all eight seasons of Ancient Aliens, but you've done so much more than that. You lecture around the world. You're a, a documentary director. You're a producer. I, you know, you're a researcher, you, you're, you've done it all and, and you've definitely deserved to be put on the map. What was your, let's go wind the clock back. When did you first get involved in realizing that all the myths from the past of gods visiting us was not necessarily mythology or uh, theology, theology in nature, but more like sure. flesh and blood extraterrestrials? <clears throat> You know, for me, Dr. J, it really just came down to uh, when I was in college, uh, looking at all these structures on Mars initially and kind of, you know, exploring those topics through a scientific lens to the validity of there being any type of artificial interaction, uh, you know, with the structures that we now know as Cydonia. And I quickly shifted my attention and realized, well, wait a minute, I'm looking at things on Mars. There are structures all over the earth that we still can't explain who really built them. And so that's what initially really caught my attention is to uh, wanting to find out where we really do come from is looking at all these megalithic structures around the world. And obviously that's still an ongoing challenge to this day. And you've traveled to so many worldly sites. Which was the one that really stuck, stuck out in your mind when you were still looking and, and wondering that just said, this does not mean this does not be extra uh, this does not be terrestrial at all i mean humans could not have built this without help well i have caught on the fence on that one really because all of the evidence that i've been stacking up at least in my book is, is pointing to a lost race now they might not be completely human but i do believe that they are actually terrestrial in nature now having said that i fully support and we can you know, come back to this topic, but I fully support the idea that throughout time, ancient civilizations, and even modern ones, have been visited by beings that are coming from other planets or some other realm of travel, but they are physical flesh and blood beings that are not human. Now, all the evidence that I've been, you know, finding, Dr. J, really, for me, megalithic monuments, uh, pyramids and Stonehenge and various sites around the world, they seem to be pointing to a lost race. Now, we've heard of the idea of Atlantis, but what I've discovered is that across many of these megalithic sites, there is a long, slender beam that's being depicted. Um, as a visual for your audience, a lot of the people might have seen the, uh, the Easter Island heads the, uh, at Rapa Nui, the, these uh, the Moai statues. That's right. And, and what we see are mainly just the heads popping out of the ground. But recently, out of archaeological discoveries, they've excavated around the heads and found that they're actually long, slender beings, but fully covered up by the earth. And at at some key other sites, at Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, uh, Bada Valley in Indonesia, and even various Sumerian figurines depict these long, slender beings, these people that seem very pious, always with their hands wrapped at the waist. Um... So for me, Dr. J, I've kind of been pointing to the idea that there is some lost race, kind of like an Atlantean culture, but they wouldn't have been on a continent that just sunk. They would have been a global civilization. And that's exactly what we see as evidence of structures predating 10,000 BC with advanced engineering and mathematics that we still can't explain who built them. I would definitely have to agree that we have to factor in the fact that there was a civilization that was living here. And there's one place in Peru, I'm sure you visited, but it has four layers, the top being the most recent, the layer below that being when the Spanish conquered it, the third layer down 
is when the Incas were there. But then the fourth layer, which seems to be thousands of years old, is so precise, you can't even fit a human hair in there, which goes to show, to me at least, that clearly the technology that they had thousands of years ago outdoes anything we can do today. Is that what you've realized as well? Yeah, for the most part, there seems to be a lot of evidence of ancient technology that pops up, and it makes us kind of scratch our head into understanding how is it that it would they would have knowledge or um, you know uh, evidence of technology that would surpass what we know today. And to answer that, Dr. J, I I kind of take a different view, and this is also part of the current research that I've really been involved with and and stimulated by, is the idea that history isn't linear. Isn't, it isn't at some point in the past we were ever so simplistic and we're now way more advanced than we ever, ever were in the past. It seems that our, our civilization here, here on Earth goes through uh, a rise and fall that is a, a constant pattern on a very large cycle of time. And there's some hints that your audience will probably be familiar with, terms like the Dark Ages or the Golden Age. Well, there is actually a, an astronomical, a, a celestial clock, if you will, put into place where over 30 ancient cultures used a system of astronomy to actually track where they were in a larger cycle of time that we today call the precession of the equinox. And so for me, Dr. J, there is a lot of science, and I'd love to dive into how I'm kind of calculating some of this, but there's a lot of science behind why the ancients built many of the megalithic monuments to pinpoint times or alignments that take place in this repeating cycle that we call the procession of the equinox. Let's go ahead and, and go into the procession of the equinox. I would love to know what some yeah. of the, the, what some of the, what you've uncovered that led you to uh, realize that these ancient civilizations were making these uh, essential markers or, or uh, time exactly. Tips. Yeah, and I mean it, it just makes logical sense. So a lot, a lot of the evidence that we're now correlating is is twofold: one, astronomical, and then geographical. So what we have are, uh, let me use the well-known artifact of the Giza Plateau as the best example. The three pyramids of Giza we now know are essentially a terrestrial map of the Orion constellation, where the Orion constellation aligns with Giza at 10,500 BC, and at that same point in time, the Sphinx is looking directly east into the constellation of Leo, which is in the shape of a lion. So it's interesting that they would mark that time astronomically at 10,000 BC. However, now we also can look geographically and geologically as well, anything geo-related really here. But what happens is, is if you look on Google Maps or um, any type of recent satellite feed of Giza, you'll see that the Nile is now several miles away from being at the footsteps of the pyramids of Giza. Just like the pharaohs of ancient times recorded being able to step off the pyramids and literally be at the foot of the Nile, we see now that the Nile has neandered way, uh, you know, many miles away from being at the foothills of the pyramids. So that, again, is uh, geological evidence for us to timestamp and date just how long it takes for the Nile to actually meander so many miles away. And you combine that with the astronomical alignments, we now have two sets of data that span multiple sites, not just Giza, where we have seen evidence that they had built structures. Uh, you mentioned Peru, so Lake Titicaca is another great example. We have Puma Punku and Teotihuacan and some of these sites located in that area that seem to have also been situated, especially Puma Punku, uh, to have been near the shores of, of water. And now they are very far away. So that gives us a more accurate timestamp for when these sites could have been actually been occupied. Uh, another important factor that a lot of people overlook is they just look at Egypt now and saying it is extremely dry, hot, and, and arid. But going back thousands of years, uh, it was probably extremely lush and, and fertile. That is probably why they settled there. I mean, who in their right mind would choose somewhere that's unlivable to start a civilization? And I think a lot of people overlook that fact that more than likely, the conditions where Egypt currently stands, the pyramids of Giza and all these other monuments are, is very different now than it was then. 
What most definitely. Yes, most definitely. And, and again, if we look at any of the scripture or texts, even hieroglyphic, you know, references, lots of visual references and, uh, you know, many of these continents. And we can see that they're they're always being depicted as utilizing water or being near water, building structures near water. Um, everyone loves to live near waterfront property that hasn't changed for thousands of years. Absolutely right, and especially then when they needed it for so many different reasons. I want to ask you about the pyramids because this is something that I always thought was really fascinating. Obviously, there's arguments to be made where how are they communicating across the Atlantic Ocean or the Pacific, but yet we find similar structures such as pyramids on virtually every major continent on this planet. Uh, And there's no way that if you look at traditional science and what the history books are telling us, that they just got into some 6,000-year-old Egyptian boat or 4,000-year-old Egyptian boat and you know, sailed across the Atlantic and happened to set up shop in, in Peru, for instance. It just doesn't make sense. So what do you think the reason is that they were able, the same race or the same beings that were occupying this planet sure. at the time were on, have the similar structures, different areas? Well, you know, a lot of the things that we have evidence of that there were, uh, you know, contact going on between the continents beyond recorded timetables, pre-Columbian, pre-Columbus and such. You know, we have the Perry Reese map uh, and various other maps that are actually showing what the continents, even the North and South Pole, look like, accurately showing the topography, sometimes under a mile of ice for the North and South Pole, yet accurately recording the land that's under the ice. Now, there's no way they'd be able to do that without land-penetrating radar, let alone the fact that they would need to be up in the sky somehow in some type of craft to get that type of, you know, uh, a visual. So it it is interesting that there are, there is evidence of knowledge, if you will, of, you know, a time that dates back to when the continents were even connected and some of the animals and things that were seen uh, across these, uh, you know, various places. So, So the only evidence that we could have is some lost race, right. That had bequeathed this information to a select few people and it was you know passed down as sacred information uh, uh, and we still have remnants of that today most religions in their holy books talk about a flood which uh, can clearly be described as the same same flood and if you're on one side of the world to you if you had no access anywhere across the waters if you thought the waters go on forever the oceans then that is your world so if you're having a a flood there to you it is a global flood do you think that flood was that permeated all these societies and is in every major religion is the same flood and do you think that was one of the reasons that wiped out that potential race it could be. I mean, it's it's very possible based on the science of looking at all the planets, including ours, that are bombarded with asteroids and comets and debris, our moon, various other planets. Uh, obviously, Jupiter takes the brunt of that. Um, but the science is there that we've had multiple bombardments, and that could be, you know, the reason why we've had, you know, issues in the past. Um, so it, it is possible that around the same time that we might have been an enlightened civilization building all these monuments and such, there could have also been some type of global catastrophe. Um, And, uh, you know, it's really hard to date those events specifically, but as far as all of the world cultures believing that same idea, I mean, you know, I was raised as a Christian and what it says in the Bible about Noah and the flood is not the original story, right? There are clear references in, in tablets written in stone that are, predating right even the old testament by at least two thousand years i knew in in uh, the louvre we have a tablet on display that's literally labeled the flood tablet and it's written in an akkadian script which is kind of a derivative of a sumerian script and it basically word for word is saying the same story of noah in the english version but it's choosing a sumerian man and it's choosing and it's telling him to locally take his family and all the animals and plants nearby into this big boat that he built. So it could have been a local flood, but it seems that that same myth permeates across multiple cultures, and it could have been stemmed from the one original story that took place just thousands and thousands of years ago, uh, just like the Sumerian tales are you know, recorded versions in stone that predate Hebrew or the New King James Version of the Bible. 
and like you said, they essentially repeat what was written in the oldest texts. And exactly uh, right, exactly. Now going so, back, oh, go on. Well, I was just going to quickly, just quickly point out also is that so we also have you know just just like in the Bible there were seven days of creation. Well, there are a, a very expanded version of that in the Atrahasis texts and even the Epic of Gilgamesh where we have these creation myths exposed in the Sumerian version that are much more elongated tales than the truncated versions we now have in the New Testament. It's actually about the beings themselves. A lot of people have talked about discovering old bones, and, and Michael Cremo even talked recently in a recent interview that here in California he found a gold mine that he believes to be dated about 5 million years old that had – uh, it would look like human bones, except they were bigger. Do you believe that there, uh, that anything you've come across is a legitimate bone of something that is larger than us, maybe eight, nine feet or t taller than that? Well, you know, a good friend of mine that passed away, unfortunately, a couple of years ago, his name was Lloyd Pye. And uh, he studied the Darwinian evolution theory quite strongly and the idea of a missing link. Um, you know, there's, there's definitely evidence to show that, let's say, the, the pre-Neanderthal, you know, the, the pre-hominid, uh, the Australopithecine, Neanderthal man, essentially did kind of evolve on their own path. And so the Bigfoot of today does exist, but we don't interact with them. They're in the deep parts of the jungles and forests. I mean, if you fly over most parts of the U.S., it's just remote forest and jungle, really. And so we only have these interactions at the edges of our cities and their jungles. So there is strong evidence across the globe that there is a Sasquatch, a Yeti, a Bigfoot. So that larger hominid structure, there isn't any evidence to suggest that they aren't highly intelligent as well. We just really haven't been able to ever confirm that they exist. So it's very possible that there's also um, some other you know, offshoot of us that was either a hybrid or um, – could potentially be some lost genetic strain, as I mentioned, from this this initial where they took. It's just like the Bible says, God created us in His image and after His likeness. Um, you know, the, these are reflected in a lot of the Sumerian tales of speaking about taking the hominid that already existed there and simply putting their genetic marker on it to create them in their image and after their likeness. Um, so they could have experimented with other strains, and it's very possible that some of the larger bones and things that we have found could be remnants of these experiments or strains that they did create. You made an extremely valid point that I think a lot of people, especially skeptics, overlook, that yes, when you fly over the U.S., there is just dense forest, and when you, uh, in a lot of areas, and that's the case in a lot of the world. I mean, the Amazon, we have yet to explore a large portion of it. And another, you mentioned Mountain Yeti, Bigfoot, Skunk Ape. There, there's another one. And a very valid point that I was trying to say that you made was we're always seeing them at the edge of their at the edge of the jungle or forest near our cities. Uh, you don't find people that are going really deep into the forest and, and finding them per se because we don't necessarily go there that much. And I think once we were able to get there, then we could probably get a little closer to that. Uh, now, going back to something you said uh, earlier on in the show, Gobleki Tepe, that was recently found. And, of course, uh, it made a big hype because it happened to be dated older than some of the known civilizations. What did you think or what was your – how did you react when you realized or found that uh, Gobleki Tepe was found? Gobleki Tepe. Gobekli Tepe. I know it's such a yeah, tongue twister. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I was pretty fascinated by Gobekli Tepe simply because that it was dated to be around 13,000 BC, um, you know, and that puts it well off the radar of any known civilization. We still, to this day, put pretty much the the pinnacle of civilization starting on the shoulders of the Sumerians at around 3,800 BC, meaning we haven't. We haven't discovered any fully fledged culture or civilization intact yet that predates Sumer, even though there are many sites, Gobekli Tepe being a prime candidate, which are clearly, you know, well beyond 3800 BC. But we don't have enough evidence or data about that culture 
to fully surmise why this site existed. Ancient Sumerians, like you mentioned, 3800 BC, just sh- under 6,000 years, just shy of 6,000 years. Then you have Gobleki Tepe, that is 13,000 BC, 15,000 years. That's a 9,000 year difference. And, and I can't believe that it's just overlooked by mainstream science. Because you've been the, I guess, on internationally acclaimed, people look up to you and look to you for answers. What is, have you gotten is the feel from the mainstream science when they refer to that structure in Turkey? Uh, well, you know, I'm not as close to it as uh, some of the other um, researchers that are going on site at Gobekli Tepe and following what what is the you know the the tone if you will of the archaeological um you know uh, excavation taking place i know that they've you know there's many stone circular structures with symbols and they seem to have some astronomical references but i don't believe that they've been able to determine any type of actual use or function for for the location yet other than it seems to have been purposely buried uh, based on the way it was, uh, you know, uh, being excavated, it seems as if they have covered it for a reason, whether to keep it safe or to hide it. So there's still a lot of variables uh, about Gobekli Tepe. But what I what I factor in for me, Dr. J, is the is the time frame, 13,000 BC, and what what I see is mainstream science being conflicted on many different levels, um, and the information that I choose to put to the test with mainstream science comes back to that topic of precession of the equinox. Uh, we do see astronomical information being displayed at Gobekli Tepe uh, that is in alignment with many of the other cultures around the world having, again, this astronomical knowledge and using animal symbols and, 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 and some type of physical reference to um, represent a constellation in the sky. I th- this is such a major fact. We are rewriting history literally as fast as we write it. So for us to not take those things into account is kind of being naive in that sense. If you don't take new information, if it doesn't fit into your model and you dismiss it, then you're you're sort of being closed minded. We we need to wake the world up per se, to have more of an open mind. You've done a fascinating job of doing so. What else do you think we can do to create more interest and to, to wake the rest of the world up so we can get the Michael Shermers, uh, so we could finally say, I told you so to them? Well, you know, there's, there's uh, lots of avenues there. Uh, one of those would be, you know, understanding more about this lost cycle of time. And uh, that is definitely something that I'm incorporating into my current lectures and explaining that, you know, we just live such a short lifespan if we're lucky 100 years plus. And this, this, this cycle that seemed to influence the rise and fall of civilizations known by over 30 ancient cultures, it kind of used astronomy as a large celestial clock. But we're talking about a 24,000-year cycle. So I think that's just one of my main quests is to expose this information, make people be able to physically interpret and comprehend why the ancients went to such lengths uh, to convey this information. And even on that note, my partner Amish and I with, uh, have started an organization called Ancient Explorers. And uh, in October of this year, we're going to be taking uh, somewhere between 20 to 50 people to some sites uh, and looking at some Maya culture and We're going to have an actual shaman priest in full feathered headdress join us on some of the pyramids while we have them really well lit up and doing these uh, interesting lectures as well as, you know, introducing people physically to these locations and seeing how there's these alignments built into these sites. I think people will be extremely fascinated to go with you because of your knowledge uh, of all these structures. Uh, Let's since we just talked about that, where can people get more information on where they can sign up for this expedition? It's uh, at ancientexplorers.com. Um, you can also just uh, check us out on Facebook. It's Ancient Explorers. Uh, we believe, I think there's almost 180,000 fans now. So you're right. It is definitely a, a topic of interest. And sometimes people aren't able to uh, join us physically uh, traveling to these sites. And you know, that's why it's great to have shows like this and YouTube and other sources where we can release this information and talk about these topics. Um, because 
you know, it really is information that is freely available to everybody. And uh, I, I think it's an interesting coincidence that just now that we're, you know, out of 2012, just as the Mayan calendar predicted, there'd be a, you know, the end of an age, not the end of, not the end of time, but the end of an age and the beginning of a new one. And that's essentially exactly what's happening is we're leaving or we've left uh, the age of Pisces and we're entering the age of Aquarius based on the way you want to look at this cycle of time. And it's an interesting thing to understand that the age of Pisces for the last 2000 years, well, that's the symbol of a fish, an astronomical symbol for Pisces is a fish. But most people will recognize seeing on the back of someone's car a, a little fish with a cross in it or, or the word Jesus. And that we reference for the last 2,000 years the idea of a fish correlating it to Jesus. Well, that's an astronomical symbol of the time of Pisces. So we have just now left the time of Pisces and we're now entering the age of Aquarius. And that's why there's this whole new shift in consciousness and change. And everyone can kind of see that exponentially our technology and sciences and everything is kind of speeding up. As well as the minds of people being more open. And that's one thing I, you mentioned a comment. Alternative media, uh, such as webcasts and YouTube, they are really starting to gain serious head headhold with regards to the five mainstream networks that run things but with regards to the mainstream networks i got to make a comment on ancient aliens the very first one off had the skeptics the michael Shermer. i remember there was this other professor from i think nyu with the mohawk guy that was just say no matter how many beers i have with my colleagues we never talk about this but yet for eight seasons once this became a show rather than a one off you've never seen those skeptics back and <laughs> I, right. I think that's really making headway. What do you think? What caused that? Because uh, I think oh, that's just great. I can tell you exactly what happened there, Dr. J. Sorry to cut you off. Um, up until Ancient Aliens, it was status quo that when you do a network show, you're going to get ridiculed. I remember doing a show for the Discovery Channel, and it was great. You know, they flew me out to this uh, Anasazi Indian ruins in the middle of the Arizona desert. And uh, I showed up on site, and the... Uh, the, the ranger was like, do you have the archaeologist Jason Martell with you? And I was like, wow, the archaeologist. He's like, yes, I'm right here. And it was very professional and handled well, and the shoot was great. But when they edited the film for, for TV, they made myself and Eric Von Daniken and others look like we were idiots, talking about aliens building the pyramids, where yet none of us had ever said we thought aliens were building pyramids. We said that the technology and the influence – had no sign of human intervention. There had to be some other source pointing to the idea that it could have been aliens, but not that aliens were actually doing it. So unfortunately, up until Ancient Aliens, Dr. J, there had been kind of a status quo that if you're going to do a special on aliens, you ridicule the people that believe in the topic, or if you're going to actually put out something in the manner of trying to put it in a positive light, you have to have balance and put in these other ludicrous people who just, you know, I, you know, it's like an ostrich with their head in the sand. Don't, mark, right. don't bother me with the facts because my mind is made up. Well, yeah, that, that lasted not even half a season. <laughs> so, yeah. That's great. One of the great things I really want to do, I remember when the Baghdad battery first came up and Michael Shermer's response was, well, so what? I mean, that just blew my mind. Just like you said, an ostrich with his head in his in the sand. And, and just like you quoted Stanton Friedman, you know, they live in that box if it doesn't fit in with it. As he always famously says, don't bother me with the facts. My mind is made up. Clearly, he is one of them. And there still seems to be several. But it looks like we're finally not giving them the airtime. And as you mentioned, that status quo, that lasted for decades. I remember seeing documentaries from the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. Ancient Aliens was the first series of its kind to not have that ridicule factor. Did you guys technically push it out or was it the audience that finally said, these ludicrous guys aren't enough. We don't want it on the, sh on the shows anymore. You know, I couldn't answer that. I have to say that was probably a decision made through either Prometheus, who's the production company in charge of Ancient Aliens, or, you know, some something higher up within History Channel. Um, but but it is interesting that, you know, the the 
the audience is really what's the voice here. Clearly, the audience is interested in the topics. They're not interested in skeptics bashing the topics. They're interested in the topics. That's why it's, you know, approaching 100 episodes. I've been very grateful to be a part of the show. And yes, I do think that it's influenced people's opinions and views um, beyond what they used to be when the, fir- when the show first started. Uh, there is much more of an acceptance to these topics, even crossing the academic border. Let me give you an example. Just last season, which will also jump into the next topic of the latest research that I'm doing. Uh, last season, shooting a special about the Ark of the Covenant and how the Ark of the Covenant could possibly be some type of large energy device, just like we've seen in Indiana Jones and various other biblical texts. It's always depicted with radiance of energy to, you know, coming out of it or beams of, of light or lightning. So we did an on-camera experiment at the University of Irvine here, here where I'm actually located in Southern California. And so it's no longer about uh, getting skeptics on the other side of the, uh, on the other side of the uh, 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 wall, if you will, or on the other side of the, of the board saying, well, you're wrong. no, now we have all the latest scientists and people on our side. Even if they don't fully support the idea, they're open-minded to the topic. So uh, I've been working with a great gentleman. His name's uh, Dr. Uh, Denon, uh, Dr. Um, Michael Denon, excuse me. And uh, he is the physics professor at UCI. And so he has been in literally like three seasons of Ancient Aliens contributing um, academic information as a physics professor and he and I on camera did uh, a full experiment with the Ark of the Covenant, a replica of the Ark of the Covenant, talking about how it could be a grounded device and the priests that carried it have insulated suits. Uh, and there's a whole uh, treatment process for essentially not getting electrocuted or somehow irradiated uh, by being around the Ark of the Covenant. You know, I, I'm wondering, this is great that we finally have academics on our side because for decades, this is what researchers such as yourself, uh, Stanton Friedman, Eric Von Donica, everybody was looking for rather than being the black sheep. You know, it, it's it's time to turn it around, as Travis Walton said, instead of us being the kooks for having these, uh, you know, open ideas, turn it around to the people that are closed minded. But let me ask you this. We talked about the cycles. Do you think the fact that we left the age of Pisces and started the age of Aquarius had something to do with opening up people's minds and finally opening up the doors to the academics that have been avoiding us for decades? It, it might be part of that process. Uh, I definitely think so. Um, I think also, too, that just the technological advances that we're making make it a little bit more difficult to refute the idea that, well, if we can find the logic behind intelligent species existing in the universe now, they probably existed back then, meaning we're already you know, finding other worlds. Um, it's very likely that soon we're going to discover uh, or at least announce uh, some other form of life being found on a comet or on Mars or on Moon or in your, on Europa after we pierce that ice and go down in the ocean there on Jupiter's moon. So all over the solar system, we're kind of gearing up to go, look, life. So I think that'll make it very easy for us to kind of transgress that idea and realize that that's been present in our solar system well beyond even our existence. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. I have to agree with you there. Right now, to date, they found 5,000 of the Goldilocks planets, not including all the other planets. But what they failed to realize is they're basing the Goldilocks planets on our living on those planets. What about life forms that are silicone based instead of carbon based? If you take that into consideration and you have all these extraterrestrial planets found that are not necessarily in the Goldilocks zones that can support a different type of life that we don't know, then that just opens up the possibilities to tenfold, if not even that much more. Wouldn't you agree? Sure. I mean, there's there's definitely uh, the possibility that there's other forms of life that aren't like bipedal beings just like us. But it is interesting that we've got the depictions from many ancient cultures that seem to show influence from what appear to be humans just like us or very similar to us uh, expressing technological advancement to ancient people. Um, there's even a more modern term for this, which is cargo cult. Uh, World War One, World War Two, 
there were American pilots that first landed in, let's say, South Africa or uh, parts of Australia, and they start interacting with these aboriginals, and a soldier gets out of a plane and lights up a cigarette, holds out a voice recorder and records the voice of the aboriginal and plays it back, and the aboriginal doesn't understand. He's He thinks that it's magic, looking at the lighter and, and, and hearing his voice. He looks at the plane and thinks it's a living being. So some interesting things start to happen. The, the planes would fly over and drop shipments of supplies to the soldiers, and Every now and then that shipment would land in the middle of the tribe instead of the soldier camp. And the tribe would crack it open and it's full of canned goods and weapons and tools. And they literally think it's like gifts from the gods. You know, like these large planes are you know, giving them gifts. They don't understand that they're not alive. So an interesting thing happens when the soldiers pack up and leave. These aboriginals on different continents scrape away runways and make models out of branches and straw very accurately depicting what looks like a prop plane. Now, they have no idea how the prop plane worked or even if it was alive or not, but they could very accurately make a model of it. And so that's what we have even throughout time, going back thousands of years, is that same notion where ancient man was influenced by things they were seeing, and ancient man went to great lengths to depict what was influencing them. I would have to agree with you there so much. And one thing that when you were talking about the, the aboriginals creating that model of that prop plane, first thing that comes to my mind is Egypt, ancient Egypt. One of the things that you have showed several times in Ancient Aliens is that little gold statue slash model that looks like a plane. And you, if one of the episodes I recall, you guys actually built a, a model. I mean, it's a little bigger than the scale added a propeller, and sure enough, it flew. Do you think that, as you mentioned, that this transgresses time of seeing things, thinking it's gods, just like the movie, The Gods Must Be Crazy, dropping the Coca-Cola bottle? Do you think that's exactly what happened with this particular instance and that particular item, that it was something they saw and decided to create as an offering or as a replica? I do. I mean, it, it, it does it does appear that they were influenced heavily by things that were happening in the skies and they didn't quite understand what was taking place. But they went to great lengths to replicate that event and pass it down as sacred information. Um, you know, this could even be shown in another way through the idolization of statues in that just like in the Sumerian creation tales and all these texts that we have from Sumerian times, they talk about living amongst the Anunnaki, living amongst these living beings that they considered gods. But eventually the Anunnaki left, and these high priests that were, you know, uh, just bestowed with this honor of interacting directly with Anunnaki and, and working with a scribe to record sacred information. Well, when the Anunnaki left, the priests were kind of, flipping out. They're like, well, what do we do? How do we record sacred information? The gods are gone. So they erected statues and said, well, let's, let's quickly erect a statue of all these various gods so that we can still idolize and talk to them and kind of carry on those same notions of getting information from them, which they really weren't anymore. Uh, so a lot of those processes were originally immortalized around some factual event or something that did take place. When What was your feeling when you first flew over the Nazca lines? I mean, that is just such a remarkable place. And to know that it wasn't even discovered until we were able to take flight, and yet it existed there for God knows how many hundreds of years, if not thousands. Did you? What was your reaction, and how, how old do you think the Nazca lines are? The, the, the Nazca lines are very hard to date. Uh, as to when they were actually scraped away the way they were. But what is interesting is that there's also figures that aren't really ever talked about right off in the foothills around the uh, the underlying landscape that we have known as the Nazca Lines. But just in the tertiary mountains and foothills, that there are these large geometric diagrams. And really no one talks about them or films them because it's a very treacherous path to get up into the foothills up there and it's filled with scorpions. Um, so you can really only get there going in a plane and it's not on the normal tourist path 
of looking at the Nazca lines. But there are all these geometric diagrams that are literally like mathematical grids based on points and lines. And I have yet to have a mathematician analyze this and try and literally connect the dots. But um, there is quite a bit of information there that shows, again, it's not just, they're not, not they're very much non-random uh, alignments. There's clear geometry being displayed, probably for some reason. I'm glad you brought up the alignments again, because that's exactly what I was thinking as you were describing these shapes. And then going back to the fact that uh, the pyramids align with Sirius, and then there's all these other structures around the world that are aligning with some astronomical, uh, astronomical, I guess, pattern of stars or whatever you want to call it. The point being is there's there's no telescopes. There was no way for them to have seen it in looking through traditional archaeology with what we found. My guess, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, is they have had to been told this or shared the wisdom about mathematics and so society as well as astronomy. Well, yes, they couldn't have just invented it. And you know, right now the Sumerians kind of have it on their shoulders at 3800 BC of, with inventing uh, literally over 100 of the first for a civilization needed for a high civilization. You know, agriculture, writing, um, math. But, you know, they had all these other things that are very interesting that uh, uh, literally spring up right out of the Stone Age. And so you have to wonder, how is it that they know this? And so a lot of people find it interesting that they've actually written it down. The Sumerians say in their texts, if you were to ask a Sumerian man, how do you know all of this information? They would tell you, everything we know, we were taught by the Anunnaki. And that's the term they use. And it's a term that in English means those who from heaven come to earth. And they were very forthcoming about living amongst these beings that they considered gods. So... What I found interesting, Dr. J, because I spent a good 10 years really diving deep into the Sumerian mytho mythologies and texts and artifacts, what I found interesting, Dr. J, up to this point, is that around 3800 BC, not only do we have the Sumerians interacting heavily and recording their information about the Anunnaki, but all around the world, there are different cultures doing the same thing, recording events of interactions with these beings they consider gods, whether it be uh, Kuku Khan or uh, over in India, uh, the, like uh, Dwarka and, and Lord Krishna. Um, it seems that around the time of 3800 BC up until around 2500 BC, there is a global uh, re recording of cultures interacting with beings they consider to be their gods. I'm glad you mentioned the word global because that is absolutely the case. I, even here in North America and South America, all the American Indian tribes talk about being yes. given wisdom from the sky Star people. people. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Going back to the alignment, or the not the alignment, the the 24,000 year cycle that we, you were talking about. Some people say the reason why we have such a cycle is because of a planet that we have yet to discover that it has that long of an orbit. And just as the moon affects our gravity and, and our tides here on Earth, so does that planet. Do you think that has anything to do with the cycle or is it just more of a natural Earth cycle? Well, you know, I haven't actually heard the idea of a planet affecting our orbit uh, causing, causing this, but the, the idea that you now Nibiru or Planet X might be something we could talk about on a separate notion. As far as the precession of the equinox, it's been something that modern science says that there is a, a lunar solar wobble. Uh, they call it the lunar solar theory. Uh, and the idea that there's this wobble being placed on the Earth based on the moon's gravitational effect. And that causes our Earth to kind of elongate slightly, not be a circle. And so that over time, every 72 years, our our North Star kind of degrades by one degree. And so over around 2,000 years, give or take, every 2,000 years, we're essentially our North Star is pointing to a new location in space. And so what's an interesting fact is that, you know, we, we seem to have, have, have discovered what the ancients already knew in that they used what we now call the 12 houses of the Zodiac 
a breakdown of the heavens, like a large celestial clock, to know what age we were in, based on just looking at, you could literally go out at the time right when the sun is rising in early morning, and whatever constellation is in the background of the sun, whatever the sun is rising against, like Pisces or Aquarius, you would know you're in the age of Pisces or in the age of Aquarius. And so they used this very simple methodology and, and essentially tied in, over 30 ancient cultures tied in astronomical data to guide not only their daily lives, but also to understand from a larger perspective where they were in this cycle of time that lasts around 24,000 years. The kicker of that information, and even Plato called it the great year, is there seems to be a correlation with a rise and fall of civilization here on Earth. We've all heard of the Dark Ages. We've all heard of the Golden Age. The latest research that I've been looking into in collaboration with something called the Binary Research Institute, uh, a business partner of mine named Walter Cruttenden runs an institute here in Newport Beach called the Binary Research Institute. And they've been calculating a more accurate model to explain the precession of the equinox. Instead of saying that our moon is just causing, causing this gravitational effect, there's actually a much more logical but far-reaching theory in that our solar system is binary. And this is why there is the precession of the equinox. Now, I'm going to pause on the word binary for a second. The idea that we're potentially a binary solar system means we don't have just one sun, we have two. Most external solar systems that have been filmed over the last 20 years are at least binary two suns, sometimes four or even six, and then intricate dances of orbits all beautifully taking place. It's very possible that we are in fact a binary system. All the observations seem to point to the idea that our sun is well beyond what's called the Oort cloud, and it's either a brown dwarf or a, you know, a failed star at this point. It's super dense and not very bright. Uh, but if we take that into account, we see a new solar system model that takes place, which is if, if we're binary, <laughs> that means our sun is in orbit around another sun. We are literally moving through space. If our sun is moving through space in orbit around another sun, we're going along for the ride as we orbit our sun. So, this is a very heavy topic to actually think that we're not a static solar system and that our sun is traveling through space around another star. And the kicker of all of that really seems to be, Dr. J, a correlation between the orbit of our two suns in that when our two suns are at their farthest point in their orbit, we're in the dark ages. When the two suns are at their closest point in their orbit, we are in what we call the golden age. And even ancient Hindu texts and the Mahabharata and various other seers and rishis of ancient times somehow knew and tapped into this knowledge to write it all down. And now our sciences are coming back and kind of reconfirming the idea that we could possibly be a binary system. And over 30 ancient cultures seem to confirm and realize the idea that there's this rise and fall of consciousness and, and civilization caused by this large astronomical cycle. I think that binary solar system idea has been really gaining a lot of ground lately. As a matter of fact, just the History Channel, the same network that you're on, the universe, the show The Universe did an entire episode on that. And Interesting. Yeah, and I huh. thought that was really, really fascinating because to me that was the first time the idea was introduced to me. And I think it would really make sense because I don't – it to, to think that we're stationary, our solar system is stationary since we've had no way to measure it by essentially going outside of it, I think that would definitely – fit in and could explain a lot of things. Now, I want to switch gears because we're nearing the end of the interview and going to ask you about Nibiru and if what your thoughts of our, on, on Nibiru and do you think that has anything to do with the fact that we may be moving in a binary system? Well, the, the, you know, adding Nibiru as a variable to this conversation um, it, it definitely even changes the model of Nibiru. I studied and worked very closely with Zachariah Sitchin and the whole idea of the word Nibiru came out of his research. This word is clearly written and documented in Sumerian texts. 
meaning another planet within our system, solar system that they called Planet of the Crossing. They symbolized it as a large glowing cross to mean where the gods, their Anunnaki, they came from, uh, predating Christianity by 2,000 years and using a large growing cross to symbolize their gods is interesting. Uh, but all of that evidence does exist from the research of Zachariah Sitchin. Now, Zachariah Sitchin always showed one sun and Nibiru in a large, elongated orbit around the sun. Now, people would question and ask, well, how does, the, how does Nibiru loop after going 3,600 years into the depths of space? How does it loop back around and come back around our sun? There was never an answer written, but there was always the, the alluding to the idea of a second sun. Even in an Encyclopedia Britannica 1989 science edition shows Pioneer 10 traveling around a second sun. So somehow this information has just been floating around in our scientific circles, but never confirmed. Well, a lot of the new data coming out around calculated models from the same people that would work at JPL or Goddard Space Center, looking at this model and saying, well, it takes less variables and it's much more easier to calculate the idea that we are simply moving through space. And that's why our angle of view changes every 2000 years. Uh, in this larger cycle of time that we now call the precession of the equinox, how they've broken down the heavens into 12 parts, like a large celestial clock. The fact that Nibiru has that 3,600 year orbit, do you think that has anything to do with the fact that there was that 3,800 BC to 2,600 BC, that 1,200 years of the Anunnaki and the astonishing technology and records that we received at the time? It could, I mean, it, it very well could be of, of influence, and there's uh, maybe some correlation. As I said, there do seems to be a global event when these beings are visiting one culture. It seems that other cultures are also recording the same similar events. So it is very possible that there's some type of you know influence that has taken place in the past. I absolutely agree, and that's why I have to hat hand my hats off to you for being out there and you are truly a pioneer if it wasn't for you and Georgios Tsoukalos Yorgos in Greek I'm Greek too by the way and of course Eric Von Donikin and all the pioneers Philip Coppins being in that first uh, series the first one-off and dealing with the Michael Shermers and all that and then finally getting enough interest from people to want to come back and and see this show presented by the facts that people such as yourself show as opposed to the skeptics debunking it i think you've you are truly one of the heroes to me and to so many people out there. I know you have to go soon, so I want to talk about just a couple more things. You're going to be speaking at Contact in the Desert. What are you going to be presenting there? And aside from the expedition that you're planning, which 180,000 fans so far are clearly excited, as am I, uh, what else do you have coming for the future? Well, you know, the lecture I'm working on, Dr. J, is going to be unveiled for the first time at Contact in the Desert. I'm pretty excited about that. We alluded earlier talking about the Ark of the Covenant. I'm doing some follow-up research and going to be uh, unveiling that um, in, in a workshop. I'm going to be doing a contact in the desert, uh, calling it just the Ark of the Covenant, the true story. Hold on to your hat for this one. Essentially, what I've been looking into is the idea that the Ark of the Covenant does not originate in a story where the Hebrews at the bottom of a mountain place the Ten Commandments into a big golden box. It turns out that even the Ten Commandments themselves are written down and recorded in the Book of the Dead and various other inscriptions and wall reliefs all over Egypt. The Ark of the Covenant itself, a big golden box with a pole on each side, is shown in wall reliefs all over Egypt. And it turns out that there's a pharaoh in one of the first dynasties known as Akhenaten. He was actually the father of King Tut, who's everyone familiar with in you know modern Egyptology, but... Akhenaten was one of these pharaohs that stood apart from all the other pharaohs and believed in a one god, worshipping what he called the Aten, the sun. But he was also big with technology. At some point he was forced out of Egypt and had to take his people with him. But it's very possible that there's a twist on this information. The Ark of the Covenant seems to fit the exact dimensions of the great sarcophagus in the Pyramid of Egypt. If you go into Khufu and look at the pyramid, uh, chamber. It's 
not built as a burial chamber. There's a big box that they call a sarcophagus. The Ark of the Covenant seems to fit the exact dimensions, the exact dimensions of the great sarcophagus, as if the Ark of the Covenant was somehow powering the Great Pyramid. Now, all the evidence suggests that the Ark was some type of large energy device, whether it was radioactive or nuclear, we don't, we don't really know. Uh, but there were procedures for how they carried it and interacted with it. And the biblical dimensions are identical uh, to what we have uh, as far as, the, as, far as the, uh, uh, the, the dimensions that we have listed uh, for the sarcophagus. So it's almost as if the, the Ark was powering the Great Pyramid, and that would be a whole new reason as to why Akhenaten, who also could have been known as Moses, left Egypt with his people, but also took the Ark of the Covenant. And that's the main reason why the Pharaoh would want to come after him, is to regain that power device powering the Great Pyramid. And I'm glad you brought up the fact that it's a power plant, because that's something that the research of you and all your team and a lot of the people on the Ancient Aliens cast have, it's led up to, to, to obviously it's not a, a tomb. Uh, there is so much more to it. And the fact that you've actually might have uncovered the source to power it is truly groundbreaking. Everybody that's going to see that at Contact in the Desert will be floored. I guarantee it. Jason, it has been an absolute wonderful time with you. We have to do this again. JasonMartel.com is your website. If you have one final thing to say to everybody, what would it be? Well, just uh, keep your eye on the future. It's going to be bright. Uh, again, Jason, it's been a fascinating time. We look forward to having you back. And again, you have a great night. And you, Thank listeners. you, and I'll be back soon. I appreciate uh, you having me on the show. Take it's, care. It's an honor. Thank you. We have an unidentified flying object. I'm Jack Osmond, and you're listening. This is Hudson Harry, and you're listening to. I'm Richard C. Hoagland, and you're listening to. I'm Mark Bell, and you're listening to Dr. J Radio Live. We have an unidentified flying object.